but it did open my eyes to the fact that, wow, what if this wasn't just a one-off? What would I do if you went back to pornography? What if you started to have a relationship with another woman? What would I do? And I didn't really want to think about it. I have to be honest, it terrified me. And if you were to relapse, I would lose you. Whether physically losing you or not, you would be lost to me. And that is my biggest fear. Has your marriage been shattered by sexual betrayal? Are you wondering if it's possible to save your marriage? Or even if you want to? Your story matters, and there is hope for your marriage through Christ Jesus. Welcome to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. I'm Johnny. I'm Emily. And friends, we've been where you are. Our marriage vows were shattered by adultery fueled by pornography. But through a commitment to recovery, our faith in God, and our hope for redemption, we set out on a journey of healing. Now our marriage is better than we ever could have imagined, and we give God all the glory. On our show, we'll talk through difficult topics, infidelity, porn addiction, recovery, and more. So if you're ready to move from pain-filled todays into hope-filled tomorrows, grab your favorite beverage and spend a little time with us. Marriage is redeemed. Hearts renewed. On Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. I am Johnny Spiegelmeyer, and sitting across the table from me this fine day is my wife, Emily. Yes, it's so good to be back here with y'all today. And we are starting to enjoy the first fruits of spring as the beautiful flowering trees are starting to make their show. So we're grateful for this time and the wonderful aromas that come from it. Oh, yeah, it's great. I love the mountain laurels, especially. Yes. It smells like grape Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, and thank you for sticking with us through our long journey through the 12 steps of recovery from Sex Addicts Anonymous. We did a wrap-up episode last week, and this week we're going to make a transition that still has some roots in recovery while moving forward into our main genre of redeeming our marriages from infidelity fueled by pornography. Today we're going to be talking about slips and relapses. Ooh, that topic sounds not so fun. <laughs> well, we quickly discovered the reality of it. Really, it, it took us by surprise. Yeah, it really did. So we chose this point to talk about slips and relapses because I felt that it was just a very natural bridge between all the work that happens with 12-step recovery that can give a sense of security, wellness, and moving forward. And then slips and relapses figure into this. And this moves us right back into how we relate to each other as we are working toward a permanent recovery with intimacy at its roots. Yes. And it's a very difficult thing when a slip or relapse occurs in a recovering relationship. It's quite the setback, but there are ways to handle it in a healthy way. Right. And we're going to look at all of that today. Yeah. But before we do that, we got a speak pipe message from one of our listeners who had a question from a previous episode where we talked about trust and trust issues after infidelity. Right. And this speak pipe is from Brooke. And we're going to just play that for you right now. Hey, I would like to ask more about never trusting your husband again. You both made a comment about this as though it was just this fact that you can't trust him. And it sounded to me like this could lead to a lot of codependent behavior, behavior and hypervigilance, which feels kind of fearful. Isn't ultimately his choices between him and the Lord. So what does this mean? And what does this look like? Thank you. Brooke, thank you so much for sending in your question and observation on our speak pipe. You're absolutely right. Many of you, if you've been listening in for this last several months as we've got our podcast going, I can say some very direct things. So when I said to Emily in one of the earlier episodes that she couldn't trust me anymore, that was really in a sense that because addiction is part of my reality and part of my life, she needs to be aware at all times. So it's my part to show up every day 
as a trustworthy man. Emily, did you want to speak into that too? Yeah, honey, I know what you meant is that you know that I can't just assume that you're now trustworthy, but that you're earning my trust every day as you stay clean and work your recovery. I can trust you, but not blindly. Not like I used to before discovery and disclosure. Back then I trusted you implicitly because there was never any reason for me not to. But now, after this devastation of infidelity, I know that it's possible for you to lie to me or it's possible for you to cheat on me. Yes. All of those things are possible, right? I never thought they were before. Right, right. So it just makes me know that I can't just say, oh, yeah, I trust you. You're such an amazing man, (laughs) which you are. But I have to trust and verify. And like she said, does it cause codependency or hypervigilance? in a relationship. Well, yes, if that was the true attitude that you could never trust your spouse again, I could see that occurring. But Johnny, you said that as an extreme to keep you honest, to keep you aware that you always need to be working on recovery and rigorous honesty and to keep me from becoming complacent. That's correct. And just to go back to address a little bit of the uh, codependent behavior and the hypervigilance that Brooke was speaking about. Emily, it's not your job to police my emotions, but what Brooke may be thinking about is if I make a blanket statement that you can't trust me anymore, that may put you into a position where you now have to manage my emotions, be watching me all the time, trying to see if I'm doing anything wrong or you having to pick up my phone all the time, things like this. And, you know, you and I went through some times like that where you just got a sense of, you know, I don't feel safe right now. And there would be those times when you would be sitting on the couch next to me and you just kind of look at me, Johnny, are you clean? Mm -hmm. And my answer to you is, yes, I am clean today. I was clean yesterday. And by God's grace, I will be clean tomorrow. Yeah. And that's about as good a guarantee as I can get. So Brooke, thank you so much for taking the time to engage with our speak pipe and ask your question. We hope that this was helpful to you and really to anybody else. And we just invite you that if you hear me say any other outrageous things that maybe don't make sense, send us an email or maybe hit that speak pipe and ask us about it because sometimes I'll just say things because I have to maintain a high alert on myself. It's the boundaries that I self-impose to make sure that I don't go there again. I am not what others would describe as walking an inch from the ditch. But I know that I never want to live that life again. So I personally set safeguards in place and I make sure that I am working it all the time. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. So again, thank you, Brooke. We really appreciate your question. And hey, sister, I know you're tired of living in the pain of betrayal. I know you're tired of being angry and suspicious. I know you are afraid of constantly being triggered and not feeling safe. And you're tired of feeling like you're all alone. You want to feel better about your spouse, your marriage, and your relationship with God, but you just don't know who to trust or where to start. I want you to stop trying to do this on your own. I want you to have hope and peace in the midst of your heartbreak. I'm going to help you learn how to cope with the loss of the husband and marriage you thought you had and how to move through the steps to healing and wholeness. You can get your confidence back and rise above the destruction to see and walk out the beautiful plan God has for you. I want you to go right now to coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com and get started with me so you can stop looking back and start moving forward. Are you ready to do this? Emily's birthday is this week, and she's giving y'all a discount on all of her sessions and bundles, booked today through Friday, March 15th. These discounts are exclusively for our Beyond Broken Vows insiders. Yeah, so just go to insider.beyondbrokenvows.com to get signed up for our weekly newsletter. In it, you'll get behind-the-scenes insights into our journey of recovery and strategies to enhance communication and intimacy with your spouse and with Jesus. You'll also get sneak peeks and exclusive content from our upcoming podcast episodes and early bird access to all our promos. And this week, you have the opportunity to coach with me at a discount. So sign up today, and I'll send you a personal email with those links inside. Yes, that link again is insider.beyondbrokenvows.com. Okay, so ladies, 
Now that you know your husband has been unfaithful and has broken covenant with you, maybe through pornography use, maybe it even escalated to being sexually active outside of your marriage, I want to ask you, what is your biggest fear? If you're like me, you're afraid that he'll do it again. This is a very real and natural thing to be concerned about. Trust me, if it happened once, it can happen again. Now, if your spouse is in recovery and making good, steady, forward progress, it may be easier for you to keep that fear at bay. A track record of trustworthiness is wonderful and comforting. It creates safety for you and brings stability to your marriage. But also, like me, you may eventually get to a place where he's doing so well that you don't think it'll happen again, and your hopeful optimism can produce an emotional crisis when a slip or a relapse in recovery occurs. So what happens next? What do we do? These are natural questions to ask and hard to answer when we're blindsided with the reality of persistent sexual integrity issues. This is why we're going to spend some time today talking about slips and relapses and the importance of having a relapse plan if we find ourselves in that precarious position. Yes, that's good. So, Johnny, would you go ahead and start us out with a prayer today? Yes, I will. Father, thank you so much for giving us this time today where we can talk over slips and relapses. Slips are going to be inevitable because nobody's perfect, but we pray, Father, that in all the relationships of those who are in our hearing and in our relationship as well, that relapses never happen. But Father, if we don't plan for these, we're going to be hurt even worse. So as we cover, Father, what it is to plan for relapses, Lord, we pray that you would meet us with your grace and mercy and that your wisdom would lead the way as to what do we do with this information and how to implement it in a very purposeful, powerful, and practical way. We're grateful, Father, for your presence and for giving us this time today. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So about three years into recovery, which would be two years ago now, I experienced my first slip in recovery, and that brought a whole new reality into our relationship, and it really took us both by surprise. Yes. For me, I couldn't understand initially why I would fall back into some old behaviors. It didn't make sense to me. But for you, Emily, what was that like when I came to you to talk to you about my slip? I was pretty much caught off guard too and in in a little bit of shock that that had happened. Your recovery had been going so well when this happened. And so, yeah, it just came out of the blue and it rocked my world again because I thought those kinds of things were done. Um, you know, I don't expect you to be perfect. Well, <laughs> actually, in the beginning, I kind of did. <laughs> right. After you started recovery, I didn't want you to make one little mistake at all. And I had to let go of that because, you know, you're human and we all make mistakes. And I had to lighten up on that thinking, you know, that that it's okay to mess up as long as we fess up. But when things are in this realm of sexual betrayal and sexual addiction, it's a little bit more serious. Right. And I was just really scared and I didn't know what to think at first. Honestly, I just hadn't even thought it could happen. And so I wasn't prepared. Yes, that's right. Slips and relapses are something that we cannot afford to be asleep about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you just expressed, it was quite a surprise. Right. I did have a slip in my recovery And that brought the reality of relapse into our world Mm -hmm. where we were not considering that as a possibility. I know that we had had conversations in the first year of recovery as I'm starting to get a better handle on who I am and what's going on and finding some recovery for myself. I remember having a discussion with you, letting you know, it's really not going to be the first two years of recovery that you need to be concerned about, that it would be the three to five year period because normal routine is starting to set back in. We're relaxing and we're not hypervigilant and we're not in crisis anymore. And that's when the unexpected things start to come back. Why? Because we let our guard down. Mm -hmm. And if this slip didn't do anything else for us, but to raise the awareness that we really can't let our guard down. Yeah, it was a real wake-up call. Absolutely. 
And from what I understand from our conversations about this, it struck you so hard that you had to have a relapse plan. Didn't even know that there was such a thing. Yeah, I didn't realize that I needed one. Didn't really understand what a relapse plan consisted of. I hadn't heard it talked about anywhere. And it wasn't on my radar because I never imagined that this could happen in our marriage at this point. Right. So let's talk a little bit about slips and relapses themselves Mm -hmm. so that we can set the record straight for our listeners. There is a very distinct difference between a slip and a relapse. Right. A slip is a one-off unplanned event to old patterns of behavior followed by a quick return to a recovery plan. Then that means there needs to be a recovery plan in place, right? That's exactly right. (laughs) It's interesting how you said that. But the very nature of a slip is that this is an unplanned event. And that's going to make it very different from a relapse, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But it's unplanned in the sense that you probably got into a situational occurrence and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the mix and you got carried away in it once again, but realized what you did wrong, repented of it, confessed it to your spouse within 24 hours. That is going to be a key component to helping your spouse recover from this as you try to move forward and repair the damage that even a slip can cause. If you can confess within the first 24 hours, it means that you've had time to process it, understand that this is the wrong path, and find the courage to talk it out. And why would somebody wait 24 hours? Explain that a little bit. It's not necessarily that it's a purposeful waiting 24 hours specifically, but to do it within 24 hours is a reasonable amount of time. The sooner the better, but it is acceptable for it to be within a 24-hour period because sometimes it's just not conducive at that moment to share that kind of information. We need to make space so that we can have this very serious conversation. What if it's in the middle of the work day and you're working? Do I come in and stop your work and confess to you about my slip? That wouldn't be practical at all and even borderline selfish by me stopping what it is that you're doing to deal with something that I did. Right. And also for those who are cooking dinner or taking care of the kids, that would be a very unkind thing to do, to stop in the middle of that and try to have that conversation. So even though it really needs to be told as soon as possible, it's also a good thing to take your partner into consideration and not disturb their reality at a bad time. That, that's absolutely right. And really anticipating and looking ahead in the next 24-hour period, when would be a good time to have that conversation? And then you be the one to initiate it. Don't let your spouse come look at you and say, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're not acting right, right? You want to be the one to initiate it. So it really solidifies the temporary nature of a slip. You slipped You recognize immediately this is not the correct behavior, and you want to correct it and move forward. But if it gets beyond 24 hours, then that can be viewed by the betrayed spouse as hiding, and that is not good. That just compounds the slip. Right. So it's absolutely imperative to do it as quickly as possible. A slip can be very painful for the betrayed because there's a lot of PTSD involved, It makes you feel like you're back at the beginning, and all those feelings of betrayal come flooding back in momentarily, hopefully momentarily, because we can sit down and talk it through now that we have the tools to do so, and we can get on stable ground a lot faster. Yes, yes. And really, a slip is a warning sign letting you know that you're moving into risky behavior, right? That's right. And we're going to talk just a little bit more about the warning signs as we get a little further into this when we talk about the three circles that will be coming up, which leads us into really where we're headed today, because what's different from a slip is a relapse. Okay, so let's go ahead and define what a relapse is. A relapse is a willful decision to move away from my recovery plan to act out again with no intention to return to my recovery plan. 
Right. It's like full-blown going back to the dog's vomit, really. Right. And the part of this that gets particularly heinous is that it is premeditated and willful rather than something that happened in the moment, like a slip that was temporary, one-off, unplanned. You know, this is where it gets to be really painful and re-traumatizes the already betrayed spouse who's still trying to work out in recovery his or her own emotions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I imagine it can be even worse than the first time. I can imagine where that would be true because you feel a sense of hope. Before you were just blindsided. Right. Now there's been some recovery and some hope just to have it dashed again. Yes. So other than the plan on how to deal with a slip when it occurs, honey, you have already actually had a plan in place to stay out of the danger zone of getting yourself into a relapse. That's called the three circles, right? Right. And with my first slip, this was the first time that I actually had to really fully engage with my three circles rather than just being a blanket statement or something written down on a sheet of paper. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk to folks about what the three circles are. And those are from the 12-step recovery program from Sex Acts Anonymous. Yes. And it's a tool that we use in order to give clear definition to our behaviors. Let me just give you a mental picture of it. It starts from a small circle on the inside and works its way outward. The inner circle is the first place that we go to to identify our no-go behaviors. This would be what constitutes acting out the behaviors that actually got us busted that are traumatizing, you know, things like infidelity. My inner circle behaviors are looking at pornography, masturbating, and having a sexual relationship with any woman that is not you, my love. Right. And those behaviors have consequences. There are natural consequences that come from acting out, like feelings of shame and guilt, sexually transmitted diseases, or an unplanned pregnancy. Those are natural consequences, but we're, we're talking more about are the practical consequences, meaning that if I were to act out in these ways again in my inner circle, this fill in the blank is what's going to happen as a result. Mm -hmm. This is boundaries, stated consequences between you and me. Like, do you want me to move out of the house? Do you want me to just to move to the other room? Now, consequences and punishments are going to be different for different couples. And we highly recommend that that's done by mutual agreement when possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me and my sobriety, this would reset my sobriety date. I would go back to day one again and, you know, start over saying I've been sober for one day. As of right now, I've got five years of sobriety, and it's motivating. I don't want to go back to that. I'm very proud of the fact that I have been able to maintain five years of sobriety when before discovery, I didn't even know it was possible to get more than one day of sobriety. Right. Yeah. And on the flip side, though, with a slip, you don't necessarily reset your sobriety date. No, it's something, again, that is just one off. And it had some circumstantial, unplanned nature to it. And I brought it to you right away and we talked through it. And my sponsor was really good when I talked to him about it. He's so good at stopping and saying, okay, Johnny, what was going on in your life? Tell me everything that's going on right now. Are there pressures? Is there a lot happening? Is there nothing happening? Are there things putting stress on your life? And what he was really trying to get me to understand is that stressors in my life were those things that prompted me to act out and manage my emotion through my acting out behaviors rather than looking at them in a more mature way, like taking them to God. Yeah. So those are my inner circle behaviors. And inner circle behavior would constitute a relapse. Mm -hmm. So then that moves us to our middle circle behaviors. Middle circle behaviors are the warning signs that we were talking about earlier. And they're not meant to be punitive. They're there to let you know that you're getting into a danger zone. These behaviors are what let you know that your next step historically has been acting out. Middle circle is where you put all of those behaviors 
thoughts, patterns, and attitudes that precede the acting out. So for me, my middle circle behavior is lying, fantasizing, hiding from you, meaning that I'm not letting you know what's going on inside of my mind. Expressions of entitlement, expressions of self-pity, expressions of pride. When I start expressing feelings like, I deserve this, or the one that's even more pervasive is, it should be this way, meaning I'm trying to dictate to the whole world the way things ought to be, Mm -hmm. rather than accepting them for the way that they are. Now, that's not rolling over when there's a grave injustice. That's not the same thing. But when traffic isn't behaving the way that you want it to, and you say they should do something about it, you're moving into an entitled sense of behavior and that heightened emotional state of of anger and entitlement are going to start leading your mind down the wrong path. That entitlement, when things aren't your way, can start leading to a sense of powerlessness. And when you start to feel powerless, you're going to be more susceptible to managing your emotions through your old acting out patterns of behavior. Nobody is immune to them. Sometimes it's just a reminder that we're human and we make mistakes. But for those of us who are recovering from addiction, we have to analyze our mistakes. It's really kind of part of our life now. We have to understand why we did what we did so that we can have a hope to correct it for a better future. Yeah, absolutely. Emily, I remember one side effect of my first slip. You got angry with yourself. Yes. You want to share a little bit about that? I did. I felt really stupid. I felt like a fool. (laughs) I was like, I can't believe that I didn't see that coming. I felt naive and was kind of kicking myself that it caught me unawares. But then I had to let myself off the hook. You know, it's like, I've never experienced any of this before. This is not something I took a class in, you know, to (laughs) know exactly how to respond to my recovering addict husband. Um, So, yeah, I was upset with myself for believing that nothing bad would ever happen again and really letting it take me by surprise. Right. And I think that that's really what was at the heart of how we were responding to Brooke through the speak pipe is that there's just a sense of security that you have as a result of good established recovery that can put you into a place of feeling really safe. And then what happens when once again, that safety feeling is shattered by reality? Yeah. Yep. It's not fun, but again, it is something that you can recover from. Yes. We can either react in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. And that's always a choice that we have. Yes, that's right. So Emily, that takes us now to the outer circle behaviors of the three circles. Outer circle behavior is the self. This is where you identify behaviors that are good, that you want to repeat Mm -hmm. and reinforce. Like when you show kindness because somebody needs kindness shown to them. You do a favor for somebody because they need help, not because it's going to make you look good. Mm-hmm. But this is also the kind of self-care where you you do some things that are good for you. Focus on healthy things like reading a good book, going for a walk, taking time to pray and meditate, a hobby that brings us joy, something that you want to do that uh, is for you. Like for me, that old windmill that sits out in front of our house, I want to take that into the shop and deconstruct it and re-weld it and build it a little bit more sturdy because I love that thing that uh, was left behind by the previous owners. And I just want to put my own personal touch to it, uh, something that I can put my creative thought and process into. And it brings me some joy and some happiness, especially since I'm working on improving my welding skills. Right. And beautifying the property as well at the same time. That's right. So, Emily, that's my plan, my plan from the betrayer's side. So I want to go ahead and move on to what your plan is. As a betrayed spouse, would you tell us a little bit about what a relapse plan would look like for you? Well, sure. Um, Honestly, when your slip happened, 
I was very distraught about it at first. And we did talk through it and we prayed through it and you talked to your sponsor and we got through it. And I felt that safety return. You know, I thought at first it was going to set me back to day one and it was a brief moment that it felt like that, but it really didn't. It was just a kind of a blip in the road, but it did open my eyes to the fact that, wow, what if this wasn't just a one-off? What would I do if you went back to pornography? What if you started to have a relationship with another woman? What would I do? And I didn't really want to think about it. I have to be honest, it terrified me. I, I wanted to stay in denial about the fact that it could possibly happen. We had been doing so well in recovery up to this point, And it was the furthest thing from my mind that you could actually possibly go back and do it again. But you know, that is one of the biggest fears of a betrayed wife. It's always kind of in the back of your mind. What if? What if he does it again? Yes. It's the most terrifying thought. And you don't want to think about it, so you kind of push it down into the background. And that's what I did. But when this slip came up, after processing through it, I realized that I needed some help moving forward. And so I reached out to my recovery community which is a betrayed wives group that I had been a part of for several years. And I found that there was a resource that they had, which was called a relapse plan. I had never heard of this before. Right. And I was like, wow, a relapse plan. Didn't know I needed one, but now I do. A relapse plan for the betrayed goes into effect whenever the betrayer has a slip or a relapse. Right. When he deviates from his plan, then her plan goes into action. That's correct. So the purpose for a relapse plan is to give the betrayed spouse a feeling of safety and support. It's a very practical tool. It helps you to outline your needs, your physical needs, emotional, financial, um, relational and spiritual needs, and logistical needs. So what's going to happen if my husband goes back to his addictive behaviors, what am I going to do? If that happens, it's going to be a highly emotionally charged time right. and hard to think and hard to process and hard to make decisions. So having a plan in advance just takes care of that. It gives you step-by-step -step things to do in that emergency. Right. It doesn't necessarily make it all better, does it? No, absolutely not. It doesn't make it better, but it makes the process easier for the betrayed spouse to move through. And those action steps give a sense of control when you feel so powerless in the face of your husband going back to those behaviors. And so basically the plan is just writing out in detail all the things that you need in place in the event the unthinkable happens. So Emily, you just described what a relapse plan is in short detail, but can you tell us a little bit about why you need a relapse plan? The most important thing, I think, is that it brings me out of denial. Actually sitting down to write out a relapse plan intimates that there's a possibility that that could happen, Right. which is something that I didn't want to look at before. I didn't want to think about. And so it breaks that denial that a slip or a relapse could even happen. And Another thing I think it does is it helps you with accountability, right? Well, it does. I mean, now that we have a relapse plan, I now know that you are planning to move forward regardless of my behavior. So again, like you just said, it puts me on notice that there will be this consequence that you will move on without me and let me deal with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And a relapse plan also is preparation. It just helps me to think of contingencies that I need to put in place before something actually does happen. So I don't have to think of it during that really emotional time. It's already been pre-thought out and all I have to do is execute. And that helps me gain stability and safety more quickly than if I had to go through the emotional distress, trying to make decisions about what I'm going to do at the same time. Right. Instead of sitting in a place, great, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Like, well, actually, I have a plan. Right. I just need to make the choice to implement it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think it's just because I'm worth it. You know, I'm worth having a plan 
for my own safety. Absolutely, my love. Emily, with all this talk about a relapse plan, you remember the kids' movie from years ago, Monsters, Inc.? Oh, I love that movie. They have this contamination code. Yeah. And there's a response. It's the 2319. Right. One of the monsters call it 2319 because there's a little sock on the shoulder of one of the scarers. So they call this 2319. And this plan goes into effect, right? Mm -hmm. There's a response team that comes in and each team member has its job to do. Right. They come in and they take care of it. They dispose of the contaminant and then they clean up the one who was contaminated and then they just leave. Right. <laughs> now, he was raw and exposed mm -hmm. at the end of that. Right. But this is a little bit about what I think with regard to a relapse plan is that these predetermined courses of action come into play in order to set things back right again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is on automatic. So you don't have to wonder what to do. You just do it. Okay. So Emily, we were just talking about what a relapse plan is and why you need one. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you implement a relapse plan? Well, like I said, I got a resource from my Betrayed Wives support group, but there are also resources you can find online. But the basic gist of it is to define for yourself, the betrayed, what constitutes a slip and what constitutes a relapse. And then if your spouse is willing to do this together with you, that's the more desirable scenario. And that's what we did. Right. You define what you think a slip consists of and what a relapse is. And then we put that together into our definition so that we're crystal clear on what these behaviors mean. Right. Now, as we've been coaching, we have come across so many of the betrayed spouses, the wives whose husbands have no plan to engage recovery whatsoever. This makes it particularly difficult for a betrayed spouse, a wife, to move forward because there can be a sense of hopelessness. Yeah, it's very difficult to move forward when your spouse is unwilling to do the hard work of recovery, but it's not impossible. Right. And instead of being able to work as a team to get to a place in your marriage where you have that connection and intimacy that you desire, you can work on yourself and get to a place where you feel safe in your relationship with God and able to function in a manner that is peaceful and joyful without your husband's input. Right. It's not the preferable thing, of course. Nobody wants that situation, but unfortunately, we can't change each other. We can't force our spouse to do anything. And that's, again, where that powerlessness comes in. We are powerless to do anything about our spouse, but we have all the power to do something about ourselves. That's right. And make the changes in ourselves that we want to see and not let our situation dictate the kind of woman that we are or want to become. That's so good. Thank you for sharing that. So in defining the relapses and slips, you did your three circles as your definitions. Right. And I agree 100% with those, but I also have a few additional things that I put on mine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so important because I can identify what I think a slip or a relapse is. And you may not necessarily agree with that, or you may want to add more to it because what's at the heart of a slip and a relapse is a feeling of not being safe mm -hmm. and a feeling of powerlessness. So you get to dictate to me what those behaviors are that make you feel powerless and make you feel unsafe. Yeah, that's exactly right. Another part of my relapse plan is listing my needs. And I can indicate whether that's an urgent thing that I need or a permanent thing that I need or I need support with. For example, physical needs. Do I need my own space after a slip or a relapse? Does that mean I just go away from the house for a few hours? Does it mean I go somewhere and spend the night with a friend or take a week and go to a hotel? Or do I ask you to leave the house? Whatever it is that makes me feel safe is what I need to do in that instance. And then for emotional needs, I can call a friend, call my sister, contact my pastor, journal, reach out to others for support. 
and there's financial needs that every wife would have to consider according to their circumstances. Some ideas might be a separate savings account and maybe some cash on hand for the wife's needs if she needs to leave the house. Um, and also just clarity between spouses that the finances will stay the same during a separation. Right. We have learned statistically that when a situation like infidelity happens and the couples ultimately end up splitting up financially, the ladies fare far worse right. than the men do. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have a financial plan. Yes. And then, of course, you can list things under the categories of relational needs and spiritual needs, um, household needs, what needs to happen at your home if this blows up. You know, Do you need somebody to come and cut your grass? or fix some things around the house that need to be done that your husband normally does, or if you have needs for your children to be picked up from school, or maybe have friends bring meals over so that you have some food for your family while you go through this emotionally destabling event. Right. It's also important to have a list of contacts and phone numbers for support. And not everybody gives you the same kind of support. You can have an emotional support team, and that could be your best friend or a relative. And then a logistics support team it could be a neighbor, it could be a coworker, right? And then a professional or spiritual support team, and that usually includes people from your church. If you're a church attender, you're your pastor, or your small group, and your counselor or coach. Right. It sounds very similar to what I have because I have my immediate reach out group too. I tell you about it first, then I will reach out to my sponsor, and I will also reach out to our senior pastor because he has walked with me every step of this journey, and I have shared everything. I've shared with him my slips. We talk them out, and he's very supportive and helps me to understand where I went wrong, but also encourages me with the work I already have done and not let the slip discourage me and help me move forward. So that support on each side of the equation is so helpful. Yes, absolutely. And so as you go through your relapse plan, jotting all these things down, then you'd categorize them into your immediate action steps that you need to take. What are the most important things that you would need to do when you are blindsided by a relapse? Just make a list and it's right there. You can keep it in your bedside table drawer or in a drawer in the kitchen or wherever you need it to be able to grab it and start executing the plan. Schedule any appointments with your counselor calling your pastor, getting an STD test, getting cash from the safe, all the different steps that would probably just go right out of your memory unless you had it right in front of you. Right. In my immediate action steps, I included things like praying because it's the most important thing to do, right? Yes. First thing to do is to pray and ask God for his help and then rehearse my truths. I have a list of truths that I go through and I rehearse the promises of God that remind me that he's with me and that I'm not in this alone. In my relapse plan, I have an area where I have written down things that would reestablish safety for me. And that's also going to be different for everybody. It's the things that I need to feel safe in the relationship again. What things need to be done or said to move into a season of reconciliation. Or if that's not going to be possible, then... What is separation or divorce going to look like and what steps need to be taken? Right. You know, that's such a good aspect because we can think about the idea of a plan. But if that plan does not have some contingency for repairing the fracture, it's really not a complete plan. Because of circumstances, you may never get to the reconciliation part, depending on how bad the relapse was and what occurred as a result of it. But that positive, optimistic side says that this is what I would want. I would want to flush this out and... Give God a chance to work it out. Right. Yeah. Because my biggest fear, Johnny, is losing you. And if you were to relapse, I would lose you. Whether physically losing you or not, you would be lost to me. And that is my biggest fear. Yes. And others of you out there might feel the same thing. And this relapse plan, it was hard. I'll be honest. I cried through it because I didn't want to even imagine a future where this would happen and living a life without you. But I know that it was healthy for me to do so 
and to be prepared and to have a plan just in case. Right. And the last thing that is included in my relapse plan is a letter to myself. And it's addressed to dear Emily, broken hearted daughter of God. And in it, I tell my future self what she needs to know in the moments of a relapse. What truths does she need to remember? What lies does she go to often that I need to remind her are lies? What courage does she need? What does she need to get back into balance and choose healthy? I think that's a really good exercise for all betrayed spouses to do. Yes, that's so good, Emily. Thank you for laying out the major aspects of a relapse plan and a little bit of our personal relapse plan and really letting some of the emotion show because it's just not easy to think about the unthinkable because you don't want to. Right. But I was just thinking that the subject of slips and relapses can quickly become something very heavy and cloudy and a little dark. But as we bring this to a close, I just wanted to encourage everyone that a relapse plan and understanding the difference between slips and relapses are all positive things. These are the things that we identify to get ahead of the problem. Mm -hmm. It brings us, like you mentioned, out of denial. Right. Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So true. Right. And that can be quite true even in this instance, even though there are some negative components that we don't want to deal with. But when they're in place, we're so glad that they're there. Mm -hmm. There are times when things go absolutely wrong and some intervention and a real serious plan needs to be put into effect. And I think that that's really what's at the heart of a relapse plan. Yeah, definitely. There certainly is a lot more that we could have said about all of this. Agreed. We've just scratched the surface. And we just wanted to give you guys a little glimpse into it and leave you with some things to think about. But we also want to point you to what God says. Yes. So here's the word. So today's word comes out of Isaiah 41, verse 10, which says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is such an amazing promise from God. And here's the hope. He has us in his strong and loving hand, and he's not going to let us go. So we don't need to fear the unknown. He knows, he cares, and he is able. So I'm going to close this in prayer today, Johnny. Father in heaven, you do know all, and you see everything. You know our future, and we can trust you with our future. But we thank you for equipping us to prepare for things that we don't want and don't expect. It's not an easy thing, Lord, to have gone through something so painful and to think about going through it again. But Jesus, you went through something so painful on our behalf to save us from all these awful things that are a part of this life. God, you've prepared a way for us through your son, Jesus Christ, to have victory in this life and in the next. And so we just thank you that you equip us and give us tools that we can use to prepare ourselves for the unknown, but also at the same time knowing that you have us and you'll never let us go. Thank you for all of your grace, your mercy, and your love. I pray for all of those listening that you would intervene in their lives and their marriages and help them to find the freedom and the joy that you want for them. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So ladies, I just want to encourage you, get a relapse plan as soon as possible. If your husband is working through his recovery plan, it's preferable to work on a relapse plan together. And the last thing I want to remind you to do is stick close to Jesus. He is really the only one who can rescue us, reconcile us, and redeem us. I did want to say as one last word of encouragement to those who are listening, you're not alone. There are many others who are going through the same circumstances you are. That's not to belittle or deny your pain. That's just to say that there are others that are going through it who have been helped. We had folks help us, and that gave us hope. Yes. And because they offered what they knew from their journey to us freely, as we're now freely offering 
parts of our journey to all of you who are listening. Know that you're not alone and there is hope. Thank you so much for being with us today. So until next time, marriage is redeemed, hearts renewed on Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before you go, if this podcast encouraged you and you're feeling some hope for today, please share this show with someone else you know who's going through a similar situation and needs to know they're not alone. One of the best ways you can help us reach more people is to leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. And as always, we would love to hear from you with questions and comments. Just email us at support at beyondbrokenvows.com. As you walk out this journey one day at a time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.